No, you do. <laughs> hey, Terry. Good to see you. Yeah, I, I don't know what happened. I had um, tried to fix my background noise and um, ended up just crashing. And I've got another background noise that called me. Can you mute, please? <laughs> I got another background noise if you don't know who that is. <laughs> so don't... Um, hey, pasta babe. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm going to... I'm sorry if this does it again. I... I... I have to find the right plugin to, to, right plug to try and get Background rid of this. Background noise. Background noise. Um, um. Oh, no, that's the one that I have already. And two. That's my problem. Um. Mm, I think it was reefer. Ah, there it is. Okay, the crackling is much less, so good. Yeah, I'm I'm just going to run a quick... And that should do her. Is that better, guys? I'm thinking that's better. <laughs> yes, it does, darling. <laughs> Sounds good. Awesome. Yeah, Terry, I had to, I have a mower running outside and stuff like that, so. Thanks, Apasta Babe. Yeah, sorry about that crash there. That was annoying as all beat heck. I clicked on the one filter and apparently it doesn't like, OBS doesn't like the one filter. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I guess so somebody's right there telling me he's going to go watch a different channel while he's watching my channel. <laughs> and it's taking it's taken him a minute to hear what I'm actually saying. <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> how are you doing, Terry? It's been a, been a little bit since I've seen you around, and, and, uh, Pasta Babe, thanks for coming again, and it's, um, I've got, oh, I don't know how well it come through, probably won't, but I've got my, there we go, ha ha. You see the drawing tablet? I've got it. Um, I've got a uh, case for it. I don't know what I should. I don't know what I should call it. It's a a caseish kind of thing for it, and um, basically, it's so that when I'm drawing, I can keep. Um, I have troubles getting down into the corner of the drawing, and that keeps my hand up while it, in a rest resting spot while I do it. So uh, this is so we're gonna see how well I can do now, and actually while I'm trying to draw something. Oh, yeah, got to keep control of that, Terry, that's for sure. Um, 
I don't know if you've seen, but my um, if my numbers are still good come um, September, the beginning of September, I go back. Uh, I'm going to get taken off uh, the pills. So, yay, little... But it's a lot of work to keep, um, to keep, you know, it's a lot of work. It's hard work. So I really hope you can keep control of it, Terry. It's, it's rough, but you'll get there, I'm sure. Um, and Angie, and hugs for everybody, too. So, we will have a listen to the... What's the first story called? Um, the first story is called blah 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 blah. A life saved by a spider and two doves. Murakami Yoshiro's faithfulness. Yeah, I butchered that. And then a story of Oki's Islands and Keep. Of the woman's sword, 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 sword. Ah, my 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 letter talking is good. Angie's dead. R.I.P. Angie. I'm sorry. <laughs> we we barely knew ye. And just watch here. My story won't come through. We'll have to see. Uh. I'll check my speakers to make sure they're correct, because when I first started talking, I didn't start talking. Uh, uh, speakers, speakers. Okay, so now we should be good to go. Oops. Now we should be good. Chapter 15 of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith. A life saved by a spider and two doves. Of Yoritomo Murray says that he lived from 1147 to 1199. He was the founder of the Shogun Eight, the first Japanese mayor of the palace, if one may so phrase it. A scion of the great house of Minamoto as shrewd and ambitious as he was unscrupulous and inhuman he was left an orphan at an early age and barely escaped death as a lad at the hands of kiyomori the then all-powerful minister who belonged to the rival house of tiara in this excellently concentrated epitome of yuri tomo's fifty-two years of life it will readily be seen that he must have had innumerable adventures fighting went on throughout his career yet oddly enough in spite of all this he died comfortably in bed in the earlier half of yorimoto's time he was once severely defeated at a battle against oba cage chika in the ishibashi mountains in the province of izu so bad had been his defeat that yoritomo with six of his most faithful followers to use vulgar language made a bolt of it they ran not over boldly but to save their skins and in their haste to escape oba cage chika's men they took like hunted hares to a large forest hoping there to escape by lying concealed after they had pushed their way into the thickest and heaviest part of the forest they came to an enormous he no ki tree partly rotten 
and containing a hollow which was large enough to hide them all yoritomo and his six followers eagerly sought refuge within the tree for in their state of tiredness they could not long hope to escape the large and active forces of oba cage chika which were following up their victory by hunting out and cutting off all those who had fled when he reached the edge of the forest oba cage chika sent his cousin oba cage toki to search for yoritomo saying go my cousin and bring in our enemy yoritomo it is the opportunity of your life for sure it is that he must be in this forest i myself will endeavor as our men come up to place them so as to surround the forest oba Kajitori was not pleased with his mission for at one time he had known and been friendly with yoritomo however he bowed low to his cousin and went off half an hour after starting obo Kajitori came to the enormous tree and found his old friend yoritomo and his six faithful attendants his heart softened and instead of carrying out his duty he returned to oba cage chika saying that he had been unable to find the enemy and that in his opinion yoritomo had escaped from the wood oba cage chika was very angry and openly said that he did not believe his cousin that to escape from the wood was impossible in such a short time come said he follow me some fifteen or twenty of you and you my cousin lead the way and show us where you went and play fair or you shall suffer for it thus bid cage toki led the way carefully avoiding the big tree for he was determined to save the life of yoritomo if he could by some misfortune however he chose an abdominally bad path and cage chika having on a particularly heavy suit of armor cried out enough of your leading let us stick to the road by which we started it is more likely to be the one which our fugitives took in any case this is no road at all where you lead us and with heavy armor on it is impossible thus it was that in due time they reached the huge tree Kajitoki was much afraid that his cousin would go into the hollow and find yoritomo and set to think how he could save him cage chika was about to enter the hollow tree when a bright idea occurred to cage toki hold said he it is no use wasting time by going in there can't you see that there's a spider's web right across the entrance it would have been quite impossible for any one to get inside without breaking it cage chika was half inclined to agree that his cousin was right but being still a little suspicious about him he put in his bow to feel what was inside just as his bow was about to be thrust against yoritomo's heavy armor which would naturally have revealed his presence two beautiful white doves flew out of the top of the hole you are right cousin said cage chika laughing when he saw the doves i am wasting time here for no one can be in this tree with wild doves in it besides the entrance being closed by a cobweb thus it was that yoritomo's life was saved by a spider and two doves when he became shogun in later years and fixed upon kamakura as his place of residence and as the seat of government two shrines were built in the temple of suruga oka which itself is dedicated to hachiman the god of war 
one is dedicated to the emperor nin toku son of ojin the god of war and the other to yoritomo called shirahata jinja the shrines were erected to show yoritomo's gratitude to the god of war for doves are known in japan as the messengers of war not of peace note i think that the shrine called by murray shirahata which means white flag is really shiro hatu the white doves the following is from murray the temple of hachiman the god of war dating from the end of the twelfth century stands in a commanding position on a hill called shiro ga oka and is approached by a stately avenue of pine trees leading up the whole way from the seashore though both avenue and temple have suffered from the ravages of time enough still remains to remind one of the ancient glories of the place three stone tori lead up to the temple which stands at the head of a broad flight of stone steps notice the magnificent icho tree nearly twenty feet in circumference and said to be over a thousand years old and the flowering trees scattered about the grounds before ascending the flight of steps the minor shrines to the rear deserve notice the nearer one painted red and called wakamiya is dedicated to the emperor nin toku son of the god of war the farther one renovated in eighteen ninety is called shira hata jinja and dedicated to yoritomo the style and structure are somewhat unusual black and gold being the only colors employed and iron being the material of the four main pillars the interior holds a small wooden image of yoritomo a side path leads up hence to the main temple which is enclosed in a square colonnade painted red the temple which was re-erected in eighteen twenty eight after having been destroyed by fire seven years previously is in the ryubu shinto style with red pillars beams and rafters and is decorated with small painted carvings chiefly of birds and animals in the colonnade are several religious palaquins mikioshi used on the occasion of the semi-annual festivals april fifteenth and december fifteenth a wooden image of sumiyoshi by unki and a few relics of yoritomo most of the relics once preserved in the temple have been removed to the residence of the chief priest hazoaki oyasu kwan and are only exhibited at festival times immediately behind the temple of hachiman is a small hill called shiraba yama where yoritomo is said to have often admired the prospect the base of the hill is enclosed and laid out as a garden end of chapter fifteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter sixteen of ancient tales and folklore of japan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c ancient tales and folklore of japan by richard gordon smith murakami yoshitiru's faithfulness murakami yoshitiru we shall call him yoshitiru for short was one of the faithful retainers of prince moriinga third son of the emperor god ego 
who reigned from 1319 to 1339. When I say reigned, I mean that God Ego was emperor, but there was a regent at the time, Hojo Takatori, who ruled with harshness and great selfishness. With the exception of young Prince Moringa, the imperial family appeared to take things easily. They preferred quietude and comfort to turbulence and quarrelling. Prince Moringa was different. Fiery tempered and proud, he thought that Hojo Takatori was usurping the emperor's rights. The man, he said, was nothing more by birth than one of the emperor's subjects and had no business to be made regent naturally these opinions led to trouble and it was not very long before prince moringa was obliged to leave the capital suddenly with his followers of whom there were some hundreds not enough to fight hojo takatori at the time prince moringa had made up his mind that it would be better to live independently in yamato than to be under the sway of hojo takatori as were his father and his elder brothers having collected the most faithful of his followers of whom the most notable was the hero of our story murakami yoshitiru the prince left the capital in disguise and started for yoshino in yamato there in the wild mountains he intended to build a castle in which to dwell for the rest of his days independent of the regent whom he held in much loathing prince moringa carried with him an imperial flag which he expected would gain for him sympathy and help even in the wild yamato province though from Kito, the then capital to the borders of yamato is in a direct line only about thirty miles the whole country is mountainous and wild roads are non-existent mountain paths taking their place consequently it was noon on the fifth day before the prince found himself at a little border village called Imogais. here he found his way blocked as it were by a guardhouse the soldiery of which had been chosen from among Imogais villagers headed by one shoji a rough and disagreeable man when prince moringa and his party of about eighty followers dressed as yamabushi fighting monks arrived flying the standard they were called to a halt by the village guard and told that they could go no farther into yamato without leaving one of themselves as hostage the prince was too haughty to speak to the villagers and explain and unfortunately murakami yoshitiru his most trusted leader could not be found for he had remained some miles behind to gather straw and make a new pair of waraji straw shoes soji leader of the imogais villagers was firm in his demand that one of the party should be left behind until their return for some twenty minutes matters stood thus neither side wanted to fight at last soji said well you may say that you are a prince i am a simple villager and i don't know you may carry the imperial flag but when you are dressed like yamabushi it does not look exactly as you were a prince as i don't want trouble and you want to pass without trouble my orders being that out of all parties over ten armed people i am to hold one as a hostage the only suggestion that i can make is that i keep as hostage this imperial flag the prince glad enough to save leaving one of his faithful followers gave the standard to soji as a hostage 
and then he and his party were allowed to pass into yamato they proceeded on their way not half an hour after they had passed murakami yoshitiru arrived at the guardhouse having made himself a pair of straw shoes to take the place of his old ones and his surprise at seeing his master's flag in such low hands was equalled by his anger what is the meaning of this he asked soji explained what had happened on hearing the story murakami lost control of his temper he flew into a violent passion he reviled soji and his men as a set of low black guards who scarcely had a right to look at the imperial standard of japan much less to dare to touch it and with that he began a general assault on the village guard killing three or four and putting the rest to flight murakami then seized the standard and ran on with it until towards evening he came up with the prince and his party who were overjoyed at what he had done at the recovery of the flag two days later the party reached yoshino and in the vicinity of this place they built a fortress where for some months they dwelt in peace it was not long however before the regent heard of the prince's whereabouts and he soon sent a small army after him for two days the fort was desperately attacked on the third the outer gates were taken two-thirds of the prince's men were dead murakami had been wounded three times and his life could not last long faithful to the end he rushed to his prince saying master i am wounded unto death in less than half an hour our enemies will have conquered us for we have but few men left your highness is unwounded and can in disguise escape when end comes give me quick your armor and let me pretend that i am your highness i will show our enemies how a prince can die changing clothes hastily and donning the prince's armor murakami bleeding badly from his wounds and already more dead than alive with weakness from the loss of blood regained the wall and struggling up the last steps he reached a point where he could see and be seen by the whole of the enemy i am prince moringa shouted he fate is against me though i am in the right sooner or later heaven's punishment will come down on you until then my curse is upon you and take a lesson as to how a prince can die emulating it if you dare when your time comes with this murakami yoshitiru drew his sword across his abdomen and seizing his quivering entrails he flung them into the midst of his enemies his dead body falling directly afterwards his head was taken to the region in quito as the head of prince moringa who escaped to plot in the future end of chapter sixteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Chapter Seventeen of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josh Kibbe. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith. A Story of Oki Islands. The Oki Islands, some forty-five miles from the mainland of Hoki Province were for centuries the scene of strife, of sorrow, and of banishment, but today they are fairly prosperous and highly peaceful. Fish, octopus, and cuttlefish form the main exports. They are a weird, wild, and rocky group, difficult of access, and few indeed are the Europeans who have visited them. I know of only two, 
the late Lafcadio Hearn, and Mr. Anderson, who was there to collect animals for the Duke of Bedford. I myself sent Otto, my Japanese hunter, who was glad to return. In the Middle Ages, that is from about the year 1000 A.D., there was much fighting over the islands by various chieftains, and many persons were sent thither in banishment. There was much fighting over the islands by various chieftains, and many persons were sent thither in banishment. In the year 1239, Hojo Yoshitoshi defeated the Emperor Go Toba and banished him to Dogen Island. Another Hojo chieftain banished another emperor, Go Daigo, to Nishi Noshima. Oriba Shima, the hero of our story, was probably banished by the same Hojo chieftain, whose name is given to me as Takatoki, Hojo, and the date of the story must be about 1320 A.D. At the time when Hojo Takatoki reigned over the country with absolute power, there was a samurai whose name was Oriba Shima. By some misfortune, Oriba, as we shall call him, had offended Hojo Takatoki and had consequently found himself banished to one of the islands of the Oki group, which was then known as Kamishima, Holy Island. So the relator of the story tells me, but I doubt his geographical statement and think the island must have been Nishinoshima, Island of the West or West Island. Since writing this, I have found that there is a very small island called Kamishima between the two main islands of the Oki archipelago, southwest of the eastern island. Oriba had a beautiful daughter, aged eighteen, of whom he was as fond as she was of him, and consequently the banishment and separation rendered both of them doubly miserable. Her name was Tokoyo, O Tokoyo-san. Tokoyo, left at her old home in Shima province, Isa, wept from morn till eve and sometimes from eve till morn. At last, unable to stand the separation any longer, she resolved to risk all and try to reach her father or die in the attempt. For she was brave, as are most girls of Shima province, where the women have much to do with the sea. As a child, she had loved to dive with the women whose daily duty is to collect awabi and pearl oyster shells, running with them the risk of life in spite of her higher birth and frailer body. She knew no fear. Having decided to join her father, O Tokoyo sold what property she could dispose of, and set out on her long journey to the far-off province of Hoki, which, after many weeks, she reached, striking the sea at a place called Akasaki, whence on clear days the islands of Oki can be dimly seen. Immediately, she set to and tried to persuade the fishermen to take her to the islands, but nearly all her money had gone, and, moreover, no one was allowed to land at the Oki Islands in those days, much less to visit those who had been banished thence. The fishermen laughed at Tokoyo, and told her that she had better go home. The brave girl was not to be put off. She bought what stock of provisions she could afford, at night went down to the beach, and, selecting the lightest boat she could find, pushed it with difficulty into the water, and sculled as hard as her tiny arms would allow her. Fortune sent a strong breeze, and the current was also in her favor. Next evening, more dead than alive, she found her efforts crowned with success. Her boat touched the shore of a rocky bay. O Tokoyo sought a sheltered spot and lay down to sleep for the night. In the morning, she awoke much refreshed, ate the remainder of her provisions, and started to make inquiries as to her father's whereabouts. The first person she met was a fisherman. No, he said, I have never heard of your father, and if you take my advice, you will not ask for him if he has been banished, for it may lead you to trouble and him to death. Poor O Tokoyo wandered from one place to another, subsisting on charity, but never hearing a word of her father. One evening she came to a little cape of rocks whereon stood a shrine. After bowing before Buddha, and imploring his help to find her dear father, O Tokoyo lay down, intending to pass the night there, for it was a peaceful and holy spot, well sheltered from the winds, which, even in summer, as it was now, the 13th of June, blow with some violence all around the Oki Islands. Tokoyo had slept about an hour when she heard, in spite of the dashing of waves against the rocks, a curious sound, the clapping of hands, and the bitter sobbing of a girl. As she looked up in the bright moonlight, she saw a beautiful person of fifteen years, sobbing bitterly. Beside her stood a man who seemed to be the shrine-keeper, or priest. He was clapping his hands and mumbling, Namu Amida Butsus. Both were dressed in white. When the prayer was over, the priest led the girl to the edge of the rocks, and was about to push her over into the sea, when O Tokoyo came to the rescue, rushing at and seizing the girl's arm just in time to save her. The old priest looked surprised at the intervention, 
but was in no way angered or put about, and explained as follows. It appears from your intervention that you are a stranger to this small island. Otherwise you would know that the unpleasant business upon which you find me is not at all to my liking or to the liking of any of us. Unfortunately, we are cursed with an evil god in this island, whom we call Yofunenushi. He lives at the bottom of the sea and demands once a year a girl just under fifteen years of age. This sacrificial offering has to be made on June thirteenth, day of the dog, between eight and nine o'clock in the evening. If our villagers neglect this, Yofunenushi becomes angered, and causes great storms which drown many of our fishermen. By sacrificing one young girl annually, much is saved. For the last seven years, it has been my sad duty to superintend the ceremony, and it is that which you have now interrupted. O Tokoyo listened to the end of the priest's explanation, and then said, Holy monk, if these things be as you say, it seems that there is sorrow everywhere. Let this young girl go, and say that she may stop her weeping, for I am more sorrowful than she, and will willingly take her place and offer myself to Yofuninushi. I am the sorrowing daughter of Oriba Shima, a samurai of high rank, who has been exiled to this island. It is in search of my dear father that I have come here. But he is so closely guarded that I cannot get to him, or even find out exactly where he has been hidden. My heart is broken, and I have nothing more for which to wish to live, and am therefore glad to save this girl. Please take this letter, which is addressed to my father, that you should try and deliver it to him is all I ask. Saying which, Tokoyo took the white robe off the younger girl and put it on herself. She then knelt before the figure of Buddha and prayed for strength and courage to slay the evil god Yofune Nushi. Then she drew a small and beautiful dagger which had belonged to one of her ancestors, and placing it between her pearly teeth, she dived into the roaring sea and disappeared, the priest and the other girl looking after her with wonder and admiration, and the girl with thankfulness. As we said at the beginning of the story, Tokoyo had been brought up much among the divers of her own country in Shima. She was a perfect swimmer, and knew moreover something of fencing and jujitsu, as did many girls of her position in those days. Tokoyo swam downwards through the clear water which was illuminated by bright moonlight. Down, down she swam, passing silvery fish, until she reached the bottom, and there she found herself opposite a submarine cave, resplendent with the phosphorescent lights issuing from awabi shells and the pearls that glittered through their openings. As Tokoyo looked, she seemed to see a man seated in the cave. Fearing nothing, willing to fight and die, she approached, holding her dagger ready to strike. Tokoyo took him for Yufune Nushi, the evil god of whom the priest had spoken. The god made no sign of life, however, and Tokoyo saw that it was no god but only a wooden statue of Hojo Takatoki, the man who had exiled her father. At first she was angry and inclined to wreak her vengeance on the statue. But after all, what would be the use of that? Better do good than evil. She would rescue the thing. Perhaps it had been made by some person who, like her father, had suffered at the hands of Hojo Takatoki. Was rescue possible? Indeed it was more. It was probable. So perceiving, Tokoyo undid one of her girdles and wound it about the statue which she took out of the cave. True, it was waterlogged and heavy, but things are lighter in the water than they are out, and Tokoyo feared no trouble in bringing it to the surface. She was about to tie it on her back. However, the unexpected happened. She beheld, coming slowly out of the depths of the cavern, a horrible thing, a luminous, phosphorescent creature of the shape of a snake, but with legs and small scales on its back and sides. The thing was twenty-seven or eight shaku, about twenty-six feet, in length. The eyes were fiery. Tokoyo gripped her dagger with renewed determination, feeling sure that this was the evil god, the Yufune Nushi, that required annually a girl to be cast to him. No doubt the Yufune Nushi took her for the girl that was his due. Well, she would show him who she was, and kill him if she could, and so save the necessity of further annual contributions of a virgin from this poor island's few. Slowly, the monster came on, and Tokoyo braced herself for the combat. When the creature was within six feet of her, she moved sideways and struck out his right eye. This so disconcerted the evil god that he turned and tried to re-enter the cavern, but Tokoyo was too clever for him. Blinded by the loss of his right eye, as also by the blood which flooded into his left, 
the monster was slow in his movements and thus the brave and agile tokoyo was able to do with him much as she liked she got to the left side of him where she was able to stab him in the heart and knowing that he could not long survive the blow she headed him off so as to prevent his gaining too far an entrance into the cave where in the darkness she might find herself at a disadvantage yofune nushi however was unable to see his way back to the depths of his cavern and after two or three heavy gasps died not far from the entrance tokoyo was pleased at her success she felt that she had slain the god that cost the life of a girl a year to the people of the island to which she had come in search of her father she perceived that she must take it and the wooden statue to the surface which after several attempts she managed to do having been in the sea for nearly half an hour in the meantime the priest and the little girl had continued to gaze into the water where tokoyo had disappeared marveling at her bravery the priest praying for her soul and the girl thanking the gods imagine their surprise when suddenly they noticed a struggling body rise to the surface in a somewhat awkward manner they could not make it out at all until at last the little girl cried why holy father it is the girl who took my place and dived into the sea i recognize my white clothes but she seems to have a man and a huge fish with her the priest had by this time realized that it was tokoyo who had come to the surface and he rendered all the help he could he dashed down the rocks and pulled her half insensible form ashore he cast his girdle round the monster and put the carved image of hojo takatoki on a rock beyond reach of the waves soon assistance came and all were carefully removed to a safe place in the village tokoyo was the heroine of the hour the priest reported the whole thing to tamayoshi the lord who ruled the island at the time and he in his turn reported the matter to lord hojo takatoki who ruled the whole province of hoki which included the islands of oki takatoki was suffering from some peculiar disease quite unknown to the medical experts of the day the recovery of the wooden statue representing himself made it clear that he was laboring under the curse of someone to whom he had behaved unjustly someone who had carved his figure cursed it and sunk it into the sea now that it had been brought to the surface he felt that the curse was over that he would get better and he did on hearing that the heroine of the story was the daughter of his old enemy oribashima who was confined in prison he ordered his immediate release and great were the rejoicings thereat the curse on the image of hojo takatoki had brought with it the evil god yofune nushi who demanded a virgin a year as contribution yofune nushi had now been slain and the islanders feared no further trouble from storms oribashima and his brave daughter o tokoyo returned to their own country in shima province where the people hailed them with delight and their popularity soon re-established their impoverished estates on which men were willing to work for nothing in the island of kamejima holy island and the oki archipelago peace reigned no more virgins were offered on june thirteenth to the evil god yofune nushi whose body was buried on the cape at the shrine where our story begins another small shrine was built to commemorate the event it was called the tomb of the sea serpent the wooden statue of hojo takatoki after much travelling found a resting place at hon soji in kamakura end of chapter seventeen recording by josh kibbe Chapter 18 of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Angelique Campbell, March 2019. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith. Cape of the Woman Sword. Footnote the title to this old and hitherto untold tale is not much less curious than the story itself which was told to me by a man called fukuga who journeys much up and down the southern coast in search of pearls and coral End note. down in the province of higo are a group of large islands framing with the mainland veritable little inland seas deep bays and narrow channels the whole of this is called Amaksa. There are a village called Amaksamura, a sea known as Amaksa Omi, an island known as Amaksa Shima, and the cape known as Jiken Shakai, which is the most prominent feature of them all, projecting into the Amaksa Sea. History relates that in the year 1577, the daimyo of the province issued an order that every one under him was to become a christian 
or be banished during the next century this decree was reversed only it was ordered that the christians should be executed tens of thousands of christianized heads were collected and sent for burial to nagasaki shimabara and amaksa this repeated for murray has not much to do with my story after all it is possible that at the time the amaksa people became christian the sword in question being in some temple was with the gods cast into the sea and recovered later by a coral or pearl diver in the bonoruku period which lasted from fifteen ninety two to fifteen ninety six a history would naturally spring from a sword so recovered but to the story the cape of zukenzaki the woman's sword cape was not always so called in former years before the benroku period it had been called furuzaki fudo is the god of fierceness always represented as surrounded by fire and holding a sword or fudo's cape the reason of the change of names was this the inhabitants of amaksa lived almost entirely on what they got out of the sea so that when it came to pass that for two years of the bunruku period no fish came into their seas or bay and they were sorely distressed many actually starved and their country was in a state of desolation their largest and longest nets were shot and hauled in vain not a single fish so large as a sardine could they catch at last things got so bad that they could not even see fish schooling outside their bay peculiar rumbling sounds were occasionally heard coming from under the sea off cape fudu but of these they thought little being japanese and used to earthquakes all the people knew was that the fish had completely gone or where they could not tell or why only one day an old and much respected fisherman said i fear my friends that the noise we so often hear off cape Buru has nothing to do with earthquakes but that the god of the sea has been displeased one evening a few days after this a sailing junk Tsukushimara, owned by one Tarada, who commanded her anchored for the night to the lee of furuzaki after having stowed their sails and made everything snug the crew pulled their beds up from below for the weather was hot and rolled them out on deck towards the middle of the night the captain was awakened by a peculiar rumbling sound seeming to come from the bottom of the sea apparently it came from the direction in which their anchor lay the rope which held it trembled visibly Dorada said the sound reminded him of the rowing of the falling tide in the Naruto Channel between Awa and Awaji Island. Suddenly, he saw towards the bows of the junk a beautiful maid clothed in the finest of white silks, he thought. She seemed, however, hardly real, being surrounded by a glimmering haze. Dorada was not a coward. Nevertheless, he roused his men for he did not quite like this as soon as he had shaken the men to their senses he moved towards the figure which when but ten or twelve feet away addressed him in the most melodious of voices thus ah oh, could i but be back in the world that is my only wish tarada astonished and affrighted fell on his knees and was about to pray when a sound of roaring waters was heard again and the white-clad maiden disappeared into the sea next morning tarada went on shore to ask the people of amaksa if they had ever heard of such a thing before and to tell them of his experiences no said the village elder two years ago we never heard the noises which we hear now off Fudo cape almost daily and we had much fish here before then but we have even now never seen the figure of the girl whom you say you saw last night surely this must be the ghost of some poor girl that has been drowned and the noise we hear must be made by the god of the sea 
who is in anger that her bones and body are not taken out of the spay where the fish so much liked to come before her body fouled the bottom a consultation was held by the fishermen they concluded that the village elder was right that some one must have been drowned in the bay and that the body was polluting the bottom it was her ghost that had appeared on tarada's ship and the noise was naturally caused by the angry god of the sea offended that his fish were prevented from entering the bay by its uncleanness what was to be done was quite clear some one must dive to the bottom in spite of the depth of water and bring the body or bones to the surface it was a dangerous job and not a pleasant one either the bringing up of a corpse that had lain at the bottom for well over a year as no one volunteered for the dive the villagers suggested a man who was a great swimmer a man who had all his life been dumb and consequently was a person of no value as no one would marry him and no one cared for him his name was sankichi or as they called him oshi no sankichi dumb sankichi he was twenty-six years of age he had always been honest he was very religious attending at the temples and shrines constantly but he kept to himself as his infirmity did not appeal to the community as soon as this poor fellow heard that in the opinion of most of them there was a dead body at the bottom of the bay which had to be brought to the surface he came forward and made signs that he would do the work or die in the attempt what was his poor life worth in comparison with the hundreds of fishermen who lived about the bay their lives depending upon the presence of fish the fishermen consulted among themselves and agreed that they would let oshi no sankichi make the attempt on the morrow and until that time he was the popular hero next day when the tide was low all the villagers assembled on the beach to give dumb sankichi a parting cheer he was towed off to Torada's junk and after bidding farewell to his few relations dived into the sea off her bows sankichi swam until he reached the bottom passing through hot and cold currents the whole way hastily he looked and swam about but no corpse or bones did he come across at last he came to a projecting rock and on the top of that he espied something like a sword wrapped in old brocade on grasping it he felt that it really was a sword on his untying the string and drawing the blade it proved to be one of dazzling brightness with not a speck of rust it is thought sankichi that japan is the country of the sword in which its spirit dwells it must be the goddess of the sword that makes the roaring sound which frightens away the fishes when she comes to the surface feeling that he had secured a rare treasure sankichi lost no time in returning to the surface he was promptly hauled on board the Sukushimara, amid the cheers of the villagers and his relations so long had he been under water and so benumbed was his body he promptly fainted fires were lit and his body was rubbed until he came to and gave by signs an account of his dive the head official of the neighborhood nerose sushum ano kami examined the sword but in spite of its beauty and excellence no name could be found on the blade and the official expressed it as his opinion that the sword was a holy treasure he recommended the erection of a shrine dedicated to fudu wherein the sword should be kept in order to guard the village against further trouble money was collected the shrine was built oshin no sankichi was made the caretaker and lived a long and happy life the fish returned to the bay for the spirit of the sword was no longer dissatisfied by being at the bottom of the sea End chapter eighteen and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Try and remember to do that while I'm, um, while the end of the show is coming up. Um, 
So that's it. I hope you enjoyed my doodling with the little tracky pad thing and and uh, I enjoyed it and hope you like the stories. Uh, as usual, have a look at LibriVox.org to make a su story suggestion and uh, we'll play it when it comes up. Love you guys. Have a wonderful night. Bye. And...